I have to be careful with our CEO, you know, it's always <laughs> very important to, to take care of her. Thank you, Suzanne, for your kind introduction. <clears throat> Good evening to uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, so many of you tonight. Our gala, as uh, you have understood, is dedicated this year to hopes and dreams uh, for Europe. So it's a big program. First, let me reassure you, uh, at Amsham EU, we are not only dreaming tonight, we are dreaming all the year, but tonight is a special evening for dreaming even more. We do so also, uh, dreaming, I mean, uh, a bit more at the end of a, of a legislature, like to now, but also we are dreaming at the beginning of a new mandate. So let me tell you briefly, on behalf of our 150 members, uh, our vision for the European Union. Our companies are committed to Europe, and I will just uh, give you two numbers for your consideration. US companies employ 4.8 million people in Europe, eight times the population of Luxembourg. <laughs> these, are, these, are a, these are many, many great people in US companies and in Luxembourg. Uh, so our companies have been operating in Europe for decades and are here to stay. We are stakeholders, not only shareholders. We want to support the attractiveness of the EU as well as make sure that uh, Europe remains one of the best places uh, in the world to live, to work, study, and raise a family. Now, allow me uh, to share with you our hope and dream for Europe. Many of us, all of us, will have a lot of hope and dreams, and I share one of you for you. And it's very simple, actually. It is keeping peace and prosperity in Europe. On a personal note, it is building on the memories of my 90 years old father, as well as my uh, thinking about the future of my uh, eight years old daughter. So we are all on duty to keep peace and prosperity in Europe. But to make dreams come true, we need more than just words. Uh, we need action. And in fact, at Amsham EU, uh, we have for you uh, for all of you, a whole agenda for action with uh, four priorities. Very briefly, one, empowering people, so we focus on people, our companies. Two, the single market, boosting the single market, which we do a lot with the Commission and with the MEPs. Leading global cooperation, and here we think obviously about uh, the EU and the US relationship, but we are thinking also about achieving the United Nations sustainable development goals like we discussed last week in New York. And last, last but not least, is of course investing in the future with a budget for innovation. Also to make dreams come true beyond action, we need collaboration and partnership. And indeed, we all know no one can deal alone with today's challenges. So we need business. We are mainly here, business. Uh, we need uh, civil society, all of us, but we need government to work side by side. We need all stakeholders, and you can count on, uh, as Suzanne said, you can count on Amsham EU as a trusted partner. Talking about partnership, or the spirit of partnership, this brings me uh, to another reason why we are gathered here tonight. We are here to honor a true European who has dedicated his entire career to public service. Jean-Claude Juncker, here tonight. So, you can, I think we can applaud and give a, a round of applause for the president. <laughs> now, let me tell you uh, a bit more about why we decided to recognize President Juncker. Uh, we live in an increasingly complex and divided world. So that's the reason why our societies need build, uh, bridge builders uh, more than ever. Bridge builders are exceptional individuals who are able to connect with those who may disagree, find common ground, and build consensus. Ultimately, they make a real difference because they bring people together. President Juncker, we uh, consider that you are one of them, definitely. So on behalf of our members, I would like to recognize your extraordinary achievements over the course of your tenure. First, you maintain and strengthen the unity of the Union. You invested a lot of time in reaching out to the European citizens. You and your whole college traveled to the regions of Europe to make the case for the Union. Second point, 
you also demonstrated an unwavering commitment to the transatlantic relationship. As you can imagine, uh, Mr. President, this is a cause that is uh, very close to our hearts here tonight. Your outstanding diplomatic skills and personal efforts were instrumental in de-escalating tensions between the EU and the US. In this respect, as we all know, the joint statement of July uh, 2018 is only one example of uh, your leadership and your work to solidify this relationship and this partnership. Now we agree there is still uh, some work to do, uh, but we are immensely grateful to your efforts. Monsieur le Président, uh, I would like to invite you uh, to join me on stage to receive this special award, which is the Amsham EU Bridge Builder Award. Mr. President. So, uh, I have maybe to take your award. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget. So, this, uh, Monsieur le Président, this award is, uh, of course, to recognize your significant contribution, particularly with regard to, as we said, to the unity of Europe and to the transatlantic relationship. Uh, it's not the Luxembourg Bridge, but it looks like a great bridge. It's a suspension bridge, as we say, and we felt it's, uh, this was a perfect metaphor. Thank okay. you, Mr. President. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the floor. Yeah. I uh, let the floor to the President. Thank you. Good idea. <laughs> Dear. Suzanne, cher Maxime, dear members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, I was starting this morning a quarter past five. <laughs> and, it, and it looks like that. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I'm told that I have always to start my speeches by saying that I'm happy to be there. It's not always true. <laughs> but tonight it's true. <laughs> because uh, we needed years to come uh, together. Although I was watching with, with sympathy from far. But it's better to see you live and in colors. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight because I'm honored to receive this uh, award. This award is uh, important to me because it symbolizes a lot of what I have tried to achieve the last five years, in fact, all my life. I must say that building bridges is not a one-man job, although one cannot succeed alone. There must be support from every side. Building bridges either in politics or in business, is about people and about personal relationships. The first thing to know about our transatlantic relationship and what makes it so spe special is that it is first and foremost a friendship. Allow me to tell you a story close to my heart. Not far away from where I was born in Luxembourg. I know that you have more employees that Luxembourg has inhabitants. It doesn't matter. The quality is what matters. <laughs> Luxembourg is the only Grand Duchy worldwide. The only one. And I'm always telling the Russians and the Chinese, why did Luxembourg never attack China or the former Soviet Union? There is one simple reason. We don't have space enough, enough to put the prisoners in. <laughs> so don't confuse size and quality. Not far away from where I was born in Luxembourg, 
is a small town called Wils. During the Second World War, Wils was hit very hard. During the Battle of the Bulge, the Bulge which for the Americans was the deadliest single battle of the Second World War. When Wills was liberated, a young corporal from the US Army's 25th, 28th Infantry Division called Richard Bookins decided to bring cheer to the children of the town by dressing up as St. Nicholas. That day, in December 1944, Mr. Bookins became a hero for the people of Wills. He was such a rare beacon of hope for a town that had lost everything. Mr. Brookins went back to Wills many times to fulfill his duty as the American St. Nicholas. Just three years ago, at the age of 49, he was awarded the highest military honor of Luxembourg. Joining, by the way, the likes of President Eisenhower, Winston Churchill, and Charles de Gaulle. You see the cortege of uh, uh, Mr. Brookings was part of. It is important, important to remind um, ourselves of stories like this. The people of Wills, like so many other Europeans, have a very special and profound friendship with the United States of America. The second thing to know about a friendship like ours is that there is always something that we can learn from each and other. The United States and the European Union are the biggest economic powers in the world. We are allies and we often think alike, but also regularly disagree with each other and sometimes have a very different political, economic or social agenda. This is why we need to build bridges. Over the years, I have traveled to the US many times and I have met with a number of presidents, as I'm a veteran. President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama, and now President uh, Trump. I remember my first visit to the White House in August 95. I was then a rather young prime minister. President Clinton had been in office for over two years, and he said, please, could you explain Europe to me? I was trying. I said, it's ununderstandable, but it works. <laughs> and uh, I started to explain to uh, Bill Clinton the uh, Economic and Monetary Union, the internal market, stuff like that. I said, no, no, no. What about Turkey? When will Turkey become a member of the European Union? In 95. There is bigger progress in the world than on that very point. But I have discovered over the years, every American president wants to know how Europe works when they are about halfway through their term. By the end, they know us better than we know ourselves. In July last year, I met uh, with President Trump at the White House and as a gift, I offered him a photo of a military cemetery in Luxembourg, where General Patton is buried. And I wrote, Dear Donald, let us remember our common history. And I, win I wanted to remind President Trump that I was there as a friend. And by the way, this American cemetery in Luxembourg has been given as a gift, as a territory to the US if a small country like the Grand Duchy is offering part of its territory to the leading nation of the world, you can see what friendship really means. We did not do it with Germany for obvious reasons. <laughs> we, we, we didn't do it with Belgium for understandable reasons. <laughs> because Belgium is preventing Luxembourg from having a free access to the oceans. And we didn't do it with France, and we would have had good reasons uh, to do so. I also wanted him to know that when the European Union stands on the international stage, we do so with the backing of every member state and of our five million 
citizens. That at least the explanation I'm giving to the US presidents when I'm at the White House. This is how the European Union does business. And I was in, in Washington last year in July to do business. At that point, we agreed to launch a new phase in the transatlantic relationship. For example, we agreed to strengthen our cooperation on energy and to increase trade in several areas. And we are sticking to our words. A year after my meeting with uh, President Trump, the European Union has increased its imports of liquefied gas, natural gas, from the US by over 350%. And the US has become Europe's number one supplier of uh, soybeans. We are delivering on what we agreed to do as friends and partners do. This tells a story of a relationship that can work for both of us. And at a time when stability comes at a premium, we must hold on what that works. This is the third thing to say about a friendship like ours. We both need it. We share the same challenges from climate change and migration <laughs> to peace and security. <laughs> we have different views on some of these issues, but that should never prevent us from looking for global solutions. Today, our economies are more intertwined than ever before. We trade roughly one trillion dollars worth of goods and services every year with each other. This is no, nearly a third of the global trade. The president is always saying that uh, the balance between Europe and the US is not fair when it comes to trade. He forgets to mention that if you include financial services in the comparison, the picture is totally opposite. I'm telling him this again and again and again. He listens, but he doesn't believe it. So when I was at the White House in July, I was mentioning these figures and he said, I, d I don't trust your figures. I said, these are the figures of the US administration. Please believe them. But trade is so much more than simply numbers. Trade is about people's livelihoods and jobs. Trade wars are easy to start, but escalate quickly and usually end badly. Whoever is starting a trade war will end badly in his own camp. Europe will always defend free and fair trade based on a level playing field and reciprocity. We will not be naive, but we are ready, willing and determined to business. And if someone is imposing tariffs on our aviation sector, we'll do exactly the same. Exactly the same. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe there is no better place for you and for your companies, eight times the number of um, Luxembourgers. This is uh, nevertheless a good place for you and for your companies to do business here in Europe. It's a pleasure, yes it is, to receive this uh, award tonight and all of you here at uh, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce are yourselves building bridges day after day between American companies and their European counterparts. This award, in fact, is yours. Our continents have been through thick and thin together, through different political cycles, but our friendship runs deep. Just ask the people of Wills. The American-European friendship is not about hopes and dreams, it's a necessity. Thank you for listening.